Allow themselves to be cheated than to go to court uh, before unbelievers, that we should, as Christians, be able to resolve our disputes internally among ourselves without involving those who are unbelievers in that uh, resolution. One of the things we were talking about at the very end, and I'd like to start with today just briefly before we move on through the rest of chapter 6, is, is it ever permissible for... Christians uh, to use the court system, our civil court system, involving other Christians. And we had uh, talked about a few uh, examples. These are mainly just thought questions. I'm not going to say that there is an absolute right or wrong answer, although for a couple of them, I think, based on what we read in 1 Corinthians 6, there is a right answer. Others are things for us to consider. Uh, the first one we use, and I'll use it here just to kind of get us refreshed again, a brother sues a brother for $100 for products he purchased. He refuses to pay. Can the brother who is owed the money take his brother to small claims court? So this situation seems very close to what, uh, almost identical to what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians 6, where you have a financial dispute among brethren, and that is something that should be able to be resolved between them without involving the outside courts, without involving worldly courts. And so, as Paul says uh, in chapter 6, find a wise person in your, a wise man in your uh, assembly, go before them, let him resolve it, and, and agree to abide by what he decides. And we also talked about um, Christ's admonitions that we should resolve our disputes quickly with the people we have disputes with, and that if there is an issue of sin, how we take that uh, we, we go first to the person, and then if that doesn't resolve it, we bring in two witnesses, and then if that doesn't resolve it, we go to the church. So I'm going to give a couple more, and then we'll move on to the rest of chapter 6. A brother is involved in an automobile accident with another brother. His brother's insurance company refuses to pay damages. Can the injured brother sue his brother so the insurance company will pay damages? See, only a lawyer would think of like some scenario, right? <laughs> Actually, this comes directly from a workbook, so it wasn't, wasn't my, my question. Uh, tr the true and false days are over with. Let me just... <laughs> so with, the way it works with insurance, as most of us know, I think, the insurance company provides payment, but it also has the ability uh, to say, we're going to allow for the claim or not, and if we don't allow for the claim, we'll provide you with an attorney, and we'll go to court on your behalf. The issue we would have in this situation is if you take this matter before the, court, or before the uh, church, the wise person in the church or the church as a whole has no op ability to bind an insurance company. And We have insurance for large things that we owe. Uh, we don't normally have that amount of cash or, or resources available to pay. So this would be one where um, I think the world on the outside would not look at it as two brethren having a dispute, but they would look at it as a, a person having a dispute with an insurance company. And as, as we know from reading 1 Corinthians 6, what Paul's teaching is we need to resolve our disputes internally so that way the outside world doesn't look at us as people who don't, uh, can't resolve things amongst our, ourselves. Is there any other thoughts on that or any other discussion?
Yes. And, and through all these examples, uh, we should be acting like Christians and behaving like Christians. I think the purpose of this example is to show that even behaving like a Christian, I can't force my insurance company to make a payment if somebody is wronged. Um, so that's, I think, why the example is given. But I, I agree with you. We have to first think of ourselves, because we are first Christians above everything else. That should dictate everything, every action we take in life. And uh, our first thought isn't, how am I going to go to court and get my money back? My first thought should be, how am I going to resolve this situation in a way that uh, is beneficial to our souls? We're again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So the last one, uh, we've talked up to this point uh, about things that involve civil court. So disputes about money or property or, or issues that uh, involve our legal rights to things we own or may possess. So the last example involves something with regarding criminal law. A brother commits a crime against another brother. Can the brother you, who is the victim involve law enforcement? So before we talk about that, I'd like to read Romans chapter 12, beginning of verse 17 into, verse, or into chapter 13. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Chapter, uh, now into chapter 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister for you, to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So we, uh, we talked a little bit last week about our responsibilities to one another, how we should uh, look to resolve our disputes quickly, and if we're dealing with a matter of sin, we involve the church. However, there can be times when something occurs that rises to a level of uh, criminal activity, something that's a crime. Now, the issue with application here is a lot of times when we're dealing with something that's a crime, we don't know who the person who committed the crime is. So if you call the police and say, my house is broken into, the police come and investigate, and they find a person who committed the crime potentially. You won't know that until the police investigate. The way our system works is once you involve the police as a victim, a lot of the next proceedings that happen are out of your hands. Once it's in the police, the hands of the police, they are the ones that decide what is investigated. And then if they believe a crime's occurred, they give it to a prosecutor who decides whether or not someone's prosecuted for the crime. The victim is allowed to give their input and say, well, I, I'd like a harsh sentence or a lenient sentence, or I'd like the person not charged at all with the crime. But ultimately, the final decision is the prosecutors, not the victims. Uh, so in civil law, when you file a lawsuit, you have complete control over that case. You can file it or not file it, dismiss it, settle it, however you, know, you want to resolve it as the plaintiff. In criminal law, the government has control uh, of the case. The, in the state or the commonwealth is the one who controls what goes forward. So that, you know, this would be a difficult situation uh, when you're dealing with something that is criminal. 
we see from Romans 13 that our criminal, our government exists for a purpose, and that is to keep us safe and to protect us. And that role is something the government is one of the primary reasons we have a government. I think when it comes to matters of crimes, that would have to be a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think that you could say there's a hard and fast rule um, when, it, when it comes to that. You know, if someone punches me, I may be saying, well, I'm willing to forgive that person. But if you have a very serious crime that occurs, you know, that may have to involve the, uh, the police and law enforcement. Not that being hit isn't something we'd all take serious, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Joe. Yes. points. Is there any, any other thoughts or questions on that before we move on? All right, we're ready to begin verse, the rest of the chapter, verses 12 through 20. And uh, let's just read three verses apiece uh, going through the end of the chapter. Joe, would you start 12 through 14, Spencer 15 through 17, Bethany, 17 through 19. Actually, if you do 17 through 20, that, that, go ahead, Joe. Thank you. I forgot to read 9 through 11, so I'll read those now, and we'll start in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we see a beginning, the transition of the thought involving uh, litigation among brethren. And that transition occurs in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So again, they were going before the unrighteous to resolve disputes. And Paul is again pointing out their, their claim knowledge here. Don't you know that the people you're going before to resolve your disputes will not inherit? Uh, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's telling them with the next sentence, do not be deceived. So they had uh, 
either gotten into a thinking or someone was telling them that those involved in certain sins may not uh, be subject to punishment or, or damnation because of those sins. So he says, do not be deceived. Do not believe the lie that those who are unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he gives a list of uh, sins in verses 9 through, and through 10. If we remember from our study in chapter 5, in verse 10, when he was talking about uh, church discipline, in chapter 5, verse 10, he gives a list of sins there. He lists covetous, sexually immoral people, covetous, extortioners, idolaters. Then in verse 11, he adds to that list and says sexually immoral, covetous, or idolater, or a viler, or drunkard, or extortioner. So verse 10 starts with one list, verse 11 expands, and then in, in chapter 6, verse 9, he expands it even farther, and he adds adulterers, homosexuals, and sodomites uh, to fornicators, and he added thieves in the list alongside of the covetous and the extortioners. And uh, it's also... I think the reason we remember from the beginning of chapter 5, there seemed to be some confusion among the Corinthian brethren about what they were supposed to do about those committing sin on the in, inside the church and those outside the church, so he provided some clarity. And I, I read verses 10, 11, and now chapter 6, verse 9, as he's trying to be as clear as possible with the brethren of, about the sins that were going on either within the congregation or within the city of Corinth that they were witnessing. And he also, uh, as we said, in verses 10, 11, and six, chapter 6, verse 9, refers to idolaters. There was the uh, temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. In addition to uh, worshiping uh, that false god, they were in, involved with sexual indulgence there at uh, the temple. So he is tying that in with the uh, sexually immoral sins that he has referenced. So these that are listed, he ends in verse 10, will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is similar to a list and the admonition that Paul gives in uh, Galatians 5 and verse 19 through 21. And I'll read that quickly. That is what we call, or what is called the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So very similar in language uh, to what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So uh, just a couple terms that you may not be as familiar with us. What is a reviler that's included in the list in 1 Corinthians 6? And that is in verse 10. Right. Someone who uses also kind of uh, harsh verbal language. Uh, there, one definition says a, a verbal assault that heaps abuse on others. So that would have a tendency to stir things up. Yes. And then extortioner. He lists uh, thieves and covetous, but also extortioner. What is an extortioner? It's uh, someone who takes from another uh, by using uh, either intimidation, abuse of authority, and also can include violence. So that would include blackmail. Yeah. Yes. And that would, of course, apply to a thief, uh, a swindler would. Yeah. Right. Making someone do something against their will, normally involving uh, a threat of some kind, yes. Yeah. 
And a lot of times involves the giving of property or, or money to a, because of that threat. All right, in verse 11, we read, And such were some of you. So some in Corinth in the church had engaged in these sins, but were now converted. Their condition, the condition they had been in, they were rescued from that condition by Christ. And so we know that conversion then means a change in life. They had gone from practicing these sins or being engaged in these sins to now being as we'll see in verse 11, washed, sanctified, and justified. So what uh, comes with the term washed? So they were, this is how they were, those sins is how they were, and, but they were, you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. Cleansed from sin, and how would they have been cleansed from sin? Baptism. So they are baptized, they're washed, they're baptized, which is a spiritual application of Christ's blood. Let's uh, look at a few verses here. Kevin, would you turn to Acts 22, verse 16? Stephanie, would you do Revelation 1, 5? Paula, Hebrews 10, 22. And Drew, could you do Titus 3, verse 5? Kevin, when you have it, you can go ahead. Acts twenty two sixteen yes. So that instruction was given to uh, Paul that he would rise, be baptized, uh, and wash away his sins. So, Revelation one five. So we are washed from our sins by Christ's blood. Of course, baptism is how we come in contact with that blood. Hebrews 10, 22. And we're, as it says, our washed, our bodies are washed in pure water. Again, the removal of uh, sin. Titus 3, verse 5. I may have written down the wrong one again. I'm sorry. And uh, Titus 3, verse 5 also includes that through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So again, this washing is uh, the conversion that occurs uh, through baptism uh, and the spiritual application of Christ's blood. So they were washed and they were also sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? I heard a set apart. That's what I was looking for. You're, we are set apart. We are set apart from sin, former life. We are regenerated uh, from that life through baptism. Tracy, would you read John 17, verse 17? And Bonnie, uh, you feel like reading? Okay. Faye, would you read Ephesians 5, 25 through 26? Luke, could you read uh, Romans 6, 17 and 18? And we will... Again, we're looking about sanctification or being sanctified, and we'll begin with John 17, 17. Right, we know that uh, the Word will sanctify us or set us apart. Ephesians 5, 25, and 26. The church will be sanctified and cleansed with the washing of water through the word. Romans 6, 17, and 18. 
So they were once, or we were once, slaves of sin. We are now set free or set apart from sin, and we are sanctified. All right, they were, sanct- they were washed, they were sanctified, and Paul says they were justified. What does it mean to be justified? That's right, to be in a righteous state or a right state. So they've gone, they've been washed, they're baptized, they're, they are set apart from their former life, they are regenerated by baptism, and they're finally justified or made in a right spiritual condition, a state of righteousness, pardoned from sin. Judy Webb, could you read uh, Romans chapter 3? And we will read, uh, if you could read verses 23 through 26. And this uh, passage will give us a further explanation on the justification we receive with our salvation through, through 26. So we see in verse 24, they were justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, in verse 26, he is the, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we are made right through the grace and faith that leads us to salvation and obedience. And this also, of course, applied to the Corinthians. And they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God is by the authority of God who by grace made possible the means of salvation. We saw that grace reference in Romans chapter 3, the reading we just did. Now we'll read Matthew 18. I'm sorry, 28. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter, or Matthew, uh, the book of Matthew in chapter 28. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So the, the washing, the sanctification, the justification occurs in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what, uh, what these verses 9 through 11, what can we take from this? What can we learn from it? That's right. The salvation is available to those who even we as Christians may think are irredeemable or or not capable of repentance and salvation. So it's in a way humbling for us and also encouraging to know that everyone is capable of being saved. Conversion does mean a change. Repentance means a change, and that's part of the conversion process, yeah. Was there a hand up in the back? Okay. (laughs) It was a good answer, good answer. 
still in that position, um, you know, like, as if they're just, uh, you know, like, it's ridiculous the life that they live because we all live that life at one point as well. Right. Good point. Anyone else before we move on to verse 12? All right, in verse 12, Paul uh, uses a phrase that apparently was a common saying in Corinth. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What Paul is saying here is not to mean that uh, Christians could indulge in impurity, although apparently some in Corinth may have been using this phrase to say they could engage in things that were sinful. But the proper application would be that there are things which God has neither required of us nor forbid of us. And we'll see an example of that in uh, chapter 8 here in a few weeks about the eating of meat sacrificed to idols. Some were extending, some in Corinth were extending this um, freedom to justify promiscuous sexual behavior. And the, the statement here in this verse 12 is that the existence of appetites or desires uh, does not justify their gratification. Paul will again re repeat this uh, phrase in first, later in the book in chapter 10, verse 23. But for us, we have to understand that even in matters of liberty, the things we're free to do, restraint is sometimes necessary. So we have a contrast here of matters where we are given a choice versus matters where we're not. And matters where we're not, such as they were using it to justify fornication, that God has legislated, it is not allowed, and you can't use your liberty that we have in Christ to engage in that. But things where we have been given liberty, we have to uh, still oftentimes show restraint. We see that from the next phrase, he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful or expedient. We have to be careful in the things we do, also how they're perceived by others and others who may not view things the same way. So it, just because something may be allowable for us doesn't mean we should engage in it. And then a further uh, continuance of that thought is, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So all things, the things that are lawful to do, there still are times when it may not be helpful or expedient to do them. And all things are lawful, you still don't want to be brought under the power of them. This is showing that we should not become a slave to any habit, and things enslave a person and operate to work as control over us uh, should be refused. Even a lawful action cannot be practiced unless it edifies and is one that we will not become enslaved by. So this leads into uh, verse 13. And this is an explanation of uh, the disposition of the mind that he was referring to in verse 12, and also a, another possible uh, saying of Corinth at the time. Foods were for the stomach and stomach for foods, but God will destroy, destroy both it, meaning foods, and them, or stomach and then foods. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Food is only design, designed for the present needs of life, so it is a folly to live for them. And what do we know the body is actually for? Not just to satisfy needs and desires. What is the body for? For the Lord, glorifying God. That is our purpose. The claim by some here is that indulging in appetites is allowed, but we see that the body is for the Lord and not the gratification of appetites. And we'll see this further explained when we get down to verse uh, 19. Do you not know the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? In 2 Corinthians, we'll see the body being the temple of the living God. And then in Romans, we know from uh, chapter 12 that we are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Verse 14, and God both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by his power. Again, here the resurrection of Christ Resurrection, our resurrection is a promise. Resurrection of Christians is promised. 
But this is bar brought up to show that we have an eternal purpose. We live for God, and our purpose is eternal. Our purpose is not carnal. Our purpose is not this earth or this world. Hitting a lot of the points that Paul had made earlier in the book about having a proper perspective on our lives, that we are not of a Paul or Apollos. That's earthly thinking. We need to have eternal or heavenly thinking. That should be our focus and our service to the Lord. So th through this, we see in verse 11, going down through verse 14, we know we were washed, sanctified, and justified, and we will be, because of that, raised, changed, and united with Christ. Any uh, comments on those verses before we move on uh, to verse 15? All right, as I mentioned before, Paul uses the phrase, do you not know, 12 times in all of his letters. He uses them 10 times to the Corinthians, and he uses them six times in this chapter alone, of all the times he uses the phrase. So verse 15 is another one of those. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take them then, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Again, he's pointing out things they should know by engaging in sexual immorality. They should know that that is not permissible and what it does and the destruction it has uh, to the body of Christ. Our bodies are members of Christ and should not be, of course, engaged in sexual immorality. Verse 16 expands on this. And do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? And then Paul uh, references uh, statement in Genesis 2, verse 24, the two shall become one flesh. God speaks in uh, Genesis 2, 24 of marriage, but here we're talking about an unholy union, not on the same plane as marriage, obviously, but in one respect, it is similar, the physical joining together. Paul is telling them not to be joined together as one flesh with those whom they are not lawfully married. And we will see... Uh, we know this point is also made further in Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and its bed is undefiled. <clears throat> but he who is, in verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. If we are joined to the Lord, then we must not defile ourselves. We know from John 15 that Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches, and we abide in him, and he in us. A Christian is joined to the Lord then through conversion, is one in spirit with the Lord, seeking, all things to, seeking in all things to conform our thoughts, our words, our deeds to such actions approved by the Lord and in harmony with the Holy Spirit. So continuing on with basically the theme that has gone through uh, a lot of chapter 5 and beginning verse 9 of uh, chapter 6, flee sexual immorality. The sexual immorality was a large problem that in the city of Corinth and among the brethren uh, in Corinth. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that, is, that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So sins, we know from, well, let me back up. Flee sexual immorality. Avoid every appearance of it. Put yourself away from it. Do not put yourself in a position to be tempted by it. We know from 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that we are provided a way of escape from temptation. And 1 Thessalonians 5, tells us to abstain from every form of evil. So what does it say, uh, what does it mean when it says every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body? Well, for many sins, the body is not the instrument performing the sin. And with sexual immorality, the body is the instrument performing the sin, and that is a sin against the body. Sin of fornication is a sin against God. In uh, Genesis, I'll turn there and read that. Genesis 39, you see Joseph and Potiphar's wife 
And this is Joseph talking to, to Potiphar's wife, who is attempting uh, to seduce him. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So we see that sexual immorality is a sin uh, against God. Verse 12 of that same passage shows us the attitude towards sexual uh, or fleeing sexual immorality. And when Joseph uh, left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside when uh, she was attempting to seduce him. It's a sin against one's body, as we read in, uh, in verse 18. It's a sin against the church, the marriage institution, and the very soul itself. And we see that in Proverbs 6, 32, which I'll read. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. So it's a, a sin against the very soul itself. So in providing this warning, Paul then in verse 19 says, again, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? We are not our own. This, uh, first, we're the, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that is in us, so we should not sin against it. We are not our own. This runs against the thinking today of my rights or looking out only for number one, whatever's best for me. Being a Christian means submission and conforming those activities to those which glorify God. We see in Matthew 16, verse 24, that we are deny, do not, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. And of course, this runs against the thinking of today where we are to do, culture, our culture tells us, do what you want to do. Follow your heart. Do what you think is right. Instead, we are to submit to the to Christ and God and the teachings uh, in the Bible. The Holy Spirit, we see in verse 19, dwells within us and guides us by means of the written word of God. We still have to make our own choices. It's still up to us to decide, but we use the, the word that we have to make those choices and to guide our choices. And we refrain from, to refrain from fornication would be the result of the Holy Spirit's influence through the written word. Right, verse 20, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, is, which are God's. How we were bought at a price, what was that price? Christ's blood, we see that in Acts 20 and verse 28. So we should ref reflect on what that means, how great a price is paid for us, for our salvation, for the hope of eternal life, and it's not something we want to throw away for earthly matters or momentary pleasure. So the conclusion of all this, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's, which are God's. Let's uh, read Matthew chapter 5. Should be able to quote from memory, but I'm not going to risk being able to quote from memory. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our goal is to glorify God, to do good things that will shine glory upon Him, and that's uh, done through obedience. So we're just about up against, uh, against the end here. Uh, next week... Uh, would the uh, visiting preacher teach the class, Ron? Okay. So it'll be a couple weeks then before we're back. We'll start with uh, Chapter 7 when I'm back up here. Thank you all for your comments and questions. <laughs>